John Hendricks is here. He founded the Discovery Channel more or less out of his kitchen with little more than personal savings and a belief that smart documentaries could compete with MTV and CNN in the new world of cable TV. That was back in 1985. Today, Discovery Communications is one of the largest media companies in the world, but faces some challenges to its business. And there's this thing called the internet. It's all discussed in Hendricks' new book, A Curious Discovery. He's here now to talk to us about it. Well, good to be here. I don't know if anyone else or everyone else is as interested in the history of television and how these things go, but I found it really fascinating. So if there are other people like me, I think it'll do very well. Uh, Discovery Channel. How did you thread this needle at this moment of transformation and, and turn it into such a successive, successful enterprise with very little backing in the beginning? Yeah, it was early on, it was kind of clear to me there was going to be some kind of a revolution happening in the late 70s, early 80s in television. The laws had to change to let satellite television exist because it was in competition with the incumbent broadcasters and so the laws were fairly protective. But that, that, all that broke down in 1975. Yeah, I learned that just in the book, that one of the barriers was you weren't allowed to put original programming on cable. That's right. You could only retransmit <laughs> what was already the, out there. Those distant signals. Yeah. And so that was very protective, And but the Supreme Court held that all of us would be entrepreneurs who wanted to create programming on television through satellite delivered cable, we had First Amendment rights and no laws should stand in the way. So we were very fortunate to, to be around at the time when cable was just starting to you know, materialize with all these wonderful satellite services that we enjoy today. We're in the midst of one of these transformative changes again with the way the internet's changing, the way people consume media. How much longer do you think the cable model as we know it can last, will last? I think for quite a while, and especially if you look globally. Decades? So, oh, I think so. I think, but it, there will be stresses on the system. There's this huge challenge of people accessing content, you know, on the internet. So you have to ask yourself, well, what's the economic models that support that content? Here's a question that I think a lot of people have, and it, it came up with HBO, but I think it applies to other networks. There's this HBO on demand that people love. They love watching their, their shows, but right. they can only get it if they already subscribe to HBO, and right. a lot of people don't have cable or they don't subscribe. From HBO's perspective, or from Discovery's right. perspective, why not sell it to the person who doesn't otherwise subscribe? Well, what we're all worried about is undermining the big revenue streams that we have today. So Discovery, the reason we can undertake expensive productions like North America, people will remember Planet Earth and some of these big undertakings, is having that revenue stream, which at Discovery is five and a half, well, it should be around five and a half billion dollars of revenue in 2013. So that's why there is this content. And so you don't want to cannibalize that. That's right. If you let people get access to the Discovery Channel away from that those revenue streams, then they may lose their inclination, you know, if they can get Discovery Channel and HBO in other forms other than through the current distribution systems, then they may lose their their motivation to subscribe to DirecTV, Dish Network, or their cable subscriber like Cox or Comcast. So when you look at it, your cable bill is why it's, some people may think of it's expensive. But if you look oh, at it, oh, it is expensive. If you look it at it, it is expensive. But if you look at it on a per channel basis, you know, if you had to subscribe to Discovery, let's say we had created a premium channel called Discovery Channel rather than a basic service, then you'd have to subscribe at maybe you know eight nine dollars a month. But the beauty of the bundle is that you package in all of this content, even channels that m maybe you don't like to watch. Yeah, you're forced to buy a lot of stuff you don't want. Yeah, well, it's People like- People want a la carte. You're very against a la carte. <laughs> very against. Well, it's a, the power of the bundle kind of materializes with a newspaper like the Washington Post. There may be some people who never look at the sports section, some people who don't look at the opinion section or the classifieds. But if you broke that apart, if the government said, you know what, you have to sell a separate Washington Post sports section and broke it apart, then that power of that bundle falls apart. And so that's what the cable... That's, that's a strange frame, though, isn't it? Because people get to choose. They don't have to buy every newspaper. They don't have to buy the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Post all in one bundle. They can choose which to buy. Yeah, but again, we, in, in the cable industry, you have two models. So if we all went ad, uh, without ad support, which is like HBO, then the channels would would cost about eight to nine dollars a month. So yeah, you could pick your ten well, channels. You wouldn't have to go without ad support. No, no. You know you can't sell advertising on cable unless first you reach fifteen million households and get measured by Nielsen. 
Yeah, we're really getting into the weeds here, but I think this because <laughs> no, no, you no, made no, this, this you, right. you made this argument in the book, and I really was surprised that you would make this argument because with the way things have changed. We sell ads, before this segment we're watching, there's a pre-roll right. ad that the Post gets a small amount of money for. Right. We don't live in this 1990s world of Nielsen ratings. And if we went a la carte, and all these networks had 5 million or 3 million subscribers, Nielsen would still want to sell ratings to people. Wouldn't they just change that threshold from 15 million to whatever? Now, if you're an advertiser, you want to reach the bulk of the viewers. So we've been through this. We've started networks. And we've struggled. When they're around 10, 12 million households, there's just no advertising. And so you don't we know think that the changes going forward. Well, we know the models. It's an economic model that's created billions of dollars of ad support that's supporting you know, all the things that we do in basic cable, whether people enjoy programming on TNT or Discovery or USA Network. Again, it's that model that gives you 120, even 200 channels for 80 to $90 a month. Okay, quickly, because we usually play questionable on Thursday. Yep. We're not really doing it. I'm just going to give you the one question. I haven't looked through these to see if they even make any sense for you, but hopefully we pull a good one. What is the last movie you liked? Oh, the last movie? I like a lot of movies. I like Prometheus. I love science fiction, and that was one that really uh, got our whole family involved in a, in a debate about it, so it was fun. Very good. Thank you so much for your time. Thank the you. book I is A it. Curious Discovery. I really did enjoy the book. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks for coming by. Thanks. Thank you. That will do it for us for tonight. We'll fold things up. Hope to see you back here tomorrow.